kingdom teaching you need. All this week on Fixing the Money Thing. We all come out of that hiring mentality, every one of us. We are trained in it. You think God's going to use hirelings? No, He's not. You don't want to be a hireling. Today's kingdom message, are you a hireling? I'm Gary Cassie, and for nine years, we lived in a chaotic, stress-filled, visionless life. I cried out to God. He said, I want my people free. America's financial coach, Gary Cassie, shares the kingdom principles that changed his life, defeated his debt, and set him free. You'll never find your destiny until you fix the money thing. Get your Bibles out. And uh, you hear how I say, you have to know how to get to your Bible. If you use devices, you won't have a big screen in your bedroom at night. Just make sure you know where to find the scriptures, that's all. You've got to be a student of the kingdom. Now, I believe today you, this message is vital, say vital, vital, to your ability to receive from God. And it's what hinders most people. And so we're going to dive into this. I'm going to bounce off of a parable that we've talked about many times just to kind of set a little bit of the story. In Luke chapter 16, let's sort of look over there. We find a very familiar story of a master of a company or whatever, but he has a manager, and the manager's not fulfilling his duties. We find this in the 16th. It's a parable of the shrewd manager. I'll just read the first verse here. There was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions, or I guess down just a bit more. So he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be my manager any longer. We don't want to hear those words, do we? No, he was disqualified. And uh, so you want to be qualified, right? And this is, of course, an analogy of how God looks at us. Really, it's an analogy. It's a story, an analogy of, of what we're, how we're to manage God's stuff. And so we find over here in the 10th verse that the master, of course, confronts this guy who is stealing from him, essentially, and is amazed that before he leaves, he puts a plan in place to prosper himself. I mean, to benefit himself. And the master is shocked that you can actually, you actually have the capacity to put a plan in place for you to prosper, which you had all along, but you did not do, is basically what he says. And so in verse 10, it says, whoever can be trusted with very little can be trusted with much. Whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. If you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? If you've not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? So where's the test at, friend? Where's the test at? Worldly wealth, where's that? At your job. That's here in the earth realm. So if you can't be trustworthy with the natural, you'll not qualify for the, God's assignments. And that's a big lesson to learn. God is looking for people who he can trust. They must be tested first, of course. You're being tested right now. People say, well, my little job, that doesn't mean much. There is no such thing as a little job. Are you trustworthy? Is it getting accomplished? That is vital to your future. So make sure you understand that. I'm not really going to spend much more time there, but I want you to understand that. And so the manager is what I would call, and I think we'd all agree, a hireling. A hireling. Jesus describes a hireling in John chapter 10, verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays his life down for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. The New King James Version says the hireling flees because he is a hireling. All right, hireling. You think God's going to use hirelings? No, he's not. You don't want to be a hireling. But hireling, we're going to get into today, is a problem that we all share at times. A hireling uh, has a hard time receiving from God. A hireling is works motivated and judges themselves by that mindset. They, are, they prove to be disloyal at times. Uh, they're untrustworthy, as we saw in the story. Uh, they're never at rest with who they are. Uh, they deal a lot with uh, feeling unworthy 
Uh, dealing with unworthiness and condemned, feeling condemned. They have a hard time celebrating someone else's victory or the, or the things they see in someone else's life. They deal with envy and jealousy very easily, get offended easily. And to talk more about the hireling, I want to jump over to Luke 15, just one chapter to your left. And a very familiar parable, again, the parable of the lost son, which really is misnamed. It's about the father, really. The story is about the father. But the hireling. So let's talk about that. Let's look here in verse number 11. Uh, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the young son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth and then had nothing left. And after he spent everything, of course, there's a severe famine happening, the Bible says. He began to be in need, so he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country feeding pigs. All right, not a good place to be. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, now from this point on is what I'm trying to get across, verse 17, he came to his senses and he said, or he remembered how many of my father's hired men have food to spare and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men So he got up and went back to his father. Now, there's a problem in the story because first we have to ask why he left to begin with because he had it all already, right? He came from a very wealthy family and and had all the provision he needed. We know that he had a wrong perspective of some things or he would never have left. Now, he has a remembrance now that he's in great need. He has a great uh, remembrance that the slaves or servants in his father's house have more than enough. And so he sets himself in a direction to head back to father's house. He has a revelation or remembrance of what? Food. Food. He needs food. And he has needs. So he sets himself to head back to father's house. Now he sets himself in a direction to enter his father's house as a slave, not as a son. Let me say it this way. Although he has a come to his senses and remembers the food at his father's house, his, the image of his father has not changed. He doesn't have a revelation yet of the father's love for him. He is simply moving on behalf of the need he has, and there's an answer, and he heads to father's house. Now, as believers, we all come to Christ in that position. In fact, Romans says it this way. I like how Romans says it in verse number four of the second chapter. Do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God brings us to repentance? It is the goodness of God. In the earth realm system, we're all survivors. We have needs. And here we find God has the answer for those needs, and we turn our look, our heart towards God. But most believers come into God's house as a slave with a religious mindset because in the earth realm, that's how everything is judged, by what you do. And everything you have is by what you do. And uh, we judge people, you know, well, that's not fair, you know. Or have you ever had someone uh, offer you a gift and you say, and you hear this quite often, oh, you don't have to do that. Why do you say that? Or someone says, uh, they have a beautiful dress. That's a beautiful dress you have on. Well, I, this old thing I bought for $5 down at the Goodwill. Why do you say that? Why do you apologize for success? Because the labor system, it's not really fair you give me that because I haven't done anything to deserve it, right? I haven't done anything to deserve it. You don't have to do that. But it wasn't your choice, was it? It was the one giving the gifts choice. And so a hireling judges their identity by what they do. When they come into the church world, the first thing they want to do is work for God. For instance, you might feel guilty if you miss church. Why do you feel guilty if you miss church? Now, I'm not saying to miss church. I'm asking you a question. Why do you feel guilty if you miss church? You think God's not happy with you? You'll find out that you have deep religious understanding. Religion teaches us that 
our righteousness is based on what we do. God's not happy with us unless we're doing things for God, with God, and, or, you know, things like that. And, he's, you know, we judge ourselves from that perspective because that's how we were trained in the earth curse system. Right? Let me say this. Until you fix that, you got a problem. Until you fix the hireling mentality, and you know it's subconscious, you don't even realize it, but when you say, oh, you don't have to do that, see, you say that about everything, even spiritual things. See, unless you understand that, you're rejecting, without even understanding what you're doing, you have a mindset, I don't need that, you know, I don't need, you know, you're going to, you're reject. so you can't receive freely. And you can't receive from father either because the same root. So we have people living in father's house as a slave. Just let me be a servant. You know, I can work in children's church. I can do this. As long as I'm doing something for God, I feel better about myself. And I feel that God's happy with me. First off, if that's how you feel, you are completely, absolutely wrong. And as long as you feel that way, you're going to have a hard time receiving from God. Because it's not your choice. It's the Father's choice. Is that right? That's right. Now, there were two sons. We talked about the younger one. But the older one, you remember the younger son came back to the father. And instead of, he was expecting judgment. He was expecting condemnation. But instead, what happened? The father ran to him, hugged him, kissed him. In the Jewish culture, now he just came out of the pigsty, right? So he's unclean. The father hugs him, which makes him unclean. The father becomes unclean on behalf of the son. He covers him with the robe. He gives him the ring of the signet ring, the authority of the kingdom. He gives him the, the, the sandals, which means he has access to the estate. He has the fatted calf. He restores him as a son. The older son's upset about this. Here's the party, comes up to the house. What is this? I hear what's going on. Finds out it's a party about his younger brother who left. And verse 28 says, he was angry and refused to go into the house. So his father went out and pleaded with him, but he answered his father, look, all these years I've been what? Slaving. What? Slaving. Slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat. So we know right away he has a wrong perspective of father, correct? His father in his mind's a hard taskmaster He's required to slave. He keeps track of the do's and don'ts. His life is governed by that, obviously. I've never disobeyed. He has the rules, and uh, you've never given me this. But the father stops him in verse 31 and says what? He says, my son, not my slave, not my servant, my son. You're always with me, and everything I have is already yours. It's already yours. His perspective of who he was and of the father did not allow him to receive from his father. You're my son. See, when people come into the church, they have this mindset of do's and don'ts. And that's what a lot of people think Christianity is all about, do's and don'ts, right? They have a wrong perspective of God that he's a hard taskmaster that he's never pleased with them. They never do enough. And God is happier if they do things for him. They usually have to battle an unworthy attitude about themselves, condemnation. They, they have fear of God. They can't relax in his presence. If I said, okay, you're going to heaven today, they'd probably be afraid. I remember uh, talking to a woman on her deathbed, Christian all of her life. I knew her very well. And uh, I think she went on to heaven like maybe 60 minutes after I talked to her. I was talking to her. And I was encouraging her with the word of God and saying, look, this is, this is, the, this is the goal of our salvation. This is, it's okay, you know, that uh, you're going to go right into the glory of God and, and you're going to step right over into that, that spiritual realm. And she said, I hope so. I was shocked because I hope so. I hope so. I hope so is not, 
This is not how it works. See, most people think if I am good enough, what, listen, this is a legal issue. It is not a hope so issue. This is a fact. What is the fact? What is the fact? Until you can relax in God's presence and know who you are, you, it, you, can't, you can't receive anything from him. And here she is, I hope so. Now, I know she called on the name of Jesus, served Jesus her whole life, but she had some wrong teaching. I hope so. Wouldn't it have been wonderful? She says, man, I can't wait. This is awesome. I'm going on to heaven. This is what I worked for my entire life, right? But she wasn't there. She says, I hope so. There's something wrong there, friend. Something wrong. She, she hasn't... She, she's still judging herself. There's things she's, she's judging herself as incomplete, something I don't know if I'm good enough. I'm not sure, you know, I'm not sure. Wrong teaching, man. You gotta get, you gotta, you gotta know the Father. It's not about you, it's the Father. People that never come to the freeing revelation of who they are and who God is struggle with their identity because we all come out of that hiring mentality, every one of us, we were trained in it. And it's going to hinder it. But you know, back a few years, in 2017, I taught a very, uh, I guess it's a very popular series, The uh, Power of Rest on the Double Portion. You remember that? Now, the double portion, just to review, was more than enough. And not two things, it means more than enough. And if you remember the manna, the sixth day, twice, they collected twice the amount, so they didn't have to work the seventh day. Remember that? Double portion in the Sabbath year. The sixth year provided enough for the seventh year. They received a double portion on the sixth year. And then the year of Jubilee, you know, they received a, almost a triple portion to last through that 49th year, which is the Sabbath year, then the 50th year, the year of Jubilee. And then for their crops to mature in the 51st year, they had enough in the 48th year to last all that time without planting their crops. All illustrating the kingdom of God. And so I was teaching that, and God had to, I guess I could say, shockingly help me understand it. Because you were, most of you know the stories, but, you know, it's interesting how we need help. To, we need a revelation. Say revelation. We need a revelation of the goodness of God. We really do. But uh, so, you know, renting a, an Escalade. Now, we drove a Honda Pilot. I still drive a Honda Ridgeline. I love Hondas. But um, uh, we had a Honda Pilot at the time, and we rented an Escalade for the women's conference. And Drenda and I got to drive it around for a couple of days, and we, we said, hey, this is pretty nice. Maybe we ought to, you know, think we, I think we liked it. I even asked Drenda, what color would you want? She said, I like, I like the pearl white. And I told you before the story that, you know, a couple weeks after that, my cell phone rings, and a gentleman who I recognized the voice said, I want to buy you an Escalade. What color do you want? Well, we got a pearl white Escalade, right? And maybe just over a year later, the engine light came on and had a, little, a couple little issues with it, which were minor. You know, we could fix those. And uh, the same guy asked me, hey, how's that Escalade working out for you? And I said, well, we had a couple issues with this, but, you know, it's fine. And he sat there and he said, I'm going to buy you a second one. And he bought a second pearl white identical Escalade. We have two. Now that caught my attention. Now, no, the first time caught my attention, right? You want to buy you an Escalade, right? But the second one really caught my attention. So wait a minute now, it's, we have two of identical Escalades. And then you heard the story of uh, someone called up on the phone, called my office. My secretary said, hey, some guy called up, he wants to buy you a gun. Well, praise God, I, you know, I like guns. <laughs> I like guns, I'll take one. And so I call him, and he said, what kind of gun do you want? I said, well, I don't know. I, I don't have any of those double barrels, those over and under double barrels, shotguns. And they're really, really beautiful. I don't have one. I'll send you one. And so the next week, a box comes with two beautiful. These are, these are the top of the line, 2000 some dollars each, shotguns. I call him and thank him. The next week, I get a box of two more from him. And about... Two or three weeks later, I get a second, another box with two more. And uh, this goes on. And then one day, I got, we got two boxes in one day. And uh, beautiful, brand new shotguns. And then Drenda had a box. She got a shotgun. And she got cash to buy jewelry with. I mean, so I had like 15 guns. Now, the first thought through your mind is, you don't need 15 guns. Right? See, if, if you ask people what... Most people tell you what they need. I need this, right? 
You don't need 15 shotguns. All the top of the line. I mean, the best there is. And so, you know, that caught my attention. I mean, I know, I know God is trying to, he's trying to help me. And then, you know, the same, this all happened within a year and a half. And then we went up to Quebec City up in Canada, which how many been there? Quebec City. Everyone's going to go there, right? You have to go to Quebec City. It's stunning, especially go at Christmas. All the snow, amazing. But uh, they have a lot of fur up there. Now, I used to trap fur growing up, the minks and, you know, muskrats, and I used to do that growing up to make some extra money. And so I, I, I admired the fur. I was even telling Drenda up there, Ben, this fur is amazing. I uh, said, I, you know, we'd mind even having some fur, you know, I just, it's just beautiful. And we walked, flew home, walked into our kitchen. On our counter were two boxes. Each box had a $5,000 black mink coat in it. One was cut for a men's cut. One was a woman's cut. Gorgeous. Mink coats. And Dorinda likes to make fun because we wore them both to Kroger's. <laughs> and uh, we drove our Escalade. <laughs> and she said, oh, this is a little strange. <laughs> but anyway. Yeah. So anyway. Those fur coats showed up. And then Drenda, on her birthday, gets two Louis Vuitton purses. Two. Two different people. And this went on. And I'm thinking, now, I know I, I didn't do any of it. And I even complained a little bit to the Lord. I said, Lord, now, you know, people are going to think we're into stuff. You know, they're going to think that we worship stuff, we idolize stuff, you know. And he said, no, you will tell them the stories. Because you didn't do it. I did it, and I did it for a reason. I said, well, I don't need 15 guns. He said, exactly. He says, when you come into the kingdom, you don't get what you need. You get the entire kingdom. And this kingdom is not short. This kingdom is not short. This kingdom is not a poverty-stricken kingdom. This is my kingdom. He, says, this is, he said, you tell the people that they, they have it all. My kingdom. You get the whole kingdom. Now, it's not about stuff. The things that happened wasn't about the stuff. It was about the Father. You understand what I'm saying? It wasn't about the stuff. It was about the Father. About my ability to receive from Father. Because we would just stop. So, you know, I don't need, I don't, I don't need another gun. I don't need another. I don't need, you know, I don't need it. That's okay. You don't have to do that. And he was saying, just stop it. You already have it all. But it's not about the things. You understand it's about my position and my identity in Christ. I already have all the kingdom. I have the kingdom. I deserve it. Until you can say, I deserve to be healed. I deserve to have that. I deserve what God says. I deserve what that promise says. Until you can say that without reservation, you're going to be hindering the ability to receive from God. You have to allow God to show himself strong. We're not hirelings, friend. Not hirelings. Hebrews 4, 16, let us approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. Amen. 